presentation of the year. My name is Dr. Amanda Zavid, and I'm the coordinator of social science in the School of Language and Liberal Studies, and I'm also coordinating the Social Science Speaker Series. It's a wonderful event, and it's wonderful to see all of you here present today to enjoy our first speaker. Just so that everyone understands how this will work, our speaker will present for 50 minutes and will end at 10 to the hour. I'm hoping that many of you have interests and questions afterwards. If you do, we're going to move next door and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions at that point. You will also have an opportunity to purchase a book, perhaps get it signed if that's something that you're interested in. Now I'd like to introduce the Chair of the School of Language and Liberal Studies, Whitney Hope, who's going to introduce our first presenter of the year. Whitney? Well, it's great to see such a good turnout at the start of another year of the Social Science Speaker Series, which was such a great success last year. And I know that again this year, with the lineup of speakers that we have, it will certainly be a success again. And it's my distinct pleasure today to introduce political activist and author Yves Anglaire, who will speak to us today on the topic, Canada on the World Stage, a force for good or bad action. Mr. Anglaire is a Montreal activist and author. He has published three books, The Black Book of Canadian Foreign Policy, Playing Left Wing, From Rink Rat to Student Radical, and finally, Canada and Haiti, waging war on the poor majority. Numerous studies have found that Canadians' self-appraisal of their country's foreign policy is more positive than any other country. Yet is Mr. Anglaire's thesis that there is a dark side to Canadian foreign policy. And he will speak to that dark side today. Mr. Anglaire's talk is especially apposite at this time inasmuch as we have recently been informed that in terms of Canadian foreign policy, Canada is the country that dare not speak its name. Strong way. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for coming out. Um, it's uh, really impressive to see this many people interested in uh, what our country is doing around the world um, to come out to an event like this. Um, so what I have here is, uh, can, people, can people see that properly? Yeah. Do you have the a bit more? Or that, that's good? I have a, a presentation based upon my book, The Black Book of Canadian Foreign Policy, um, with a, a sort of summary of, uh, of Canada's role in the world, um, sort of some tidbits out of this book that I thought people might be interested in. For me, this book, The Black Book of Canadian Foreign Policy, comes out of my role in the Haiti Solidarity Movement. Uh, in February 2004, the Canadian government, Canadian troops, um, actually invaded Haiti, um, supported the U.S. Marines, providing quote-unquote security at the airport that U.S. Marines took forcibly, in the words of the ousted president, Jean Bertrand, he kidnapped Haiti's elected president. Um, Canadian troops were providing security at the airport that Aristide says he was kidnapped from and dumped uh, in the Central African Republic. Over the next couple of years, Canada supported this brutal dictatorship of Gérard Latortu that was taken from southern Florida and put uh, into the prime ministerial position uh, in Haiti. Canada provided significant hundreds of millions of dollars in aid to this elected, uh, unelected government that was responsible for thousands of people being killed. According to the British Medical Journal, The Lancet, uh, uh, 8,000 people were killed in the 22 months after the coup. Uh, half of those people, just, this is just in Paul Prince, the capital of Haiti, half of those people were killed by political actors that in one way or another the Canadian government was aligned with. Uh, Haitian National Police being trained, financed, uh, 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 justified by Canadian politicians, uh, going into the slum neighborhoods, bastions of support for the elected government, and killing people, firing on unarmed demonstrations, demanding the return of the elected president. And this was going on uh, with all elements of the Canadian state 
the military, our aid, our diplomats justifying it, supporting this brutal crime uh, against the Haitian people. So for me, uh, this book, the Black Book of Canadian Foreign Policy, comes out of participating in this Haiti Solidarity Movement, in participating in this movement in Montreal and across the country to say no to what Canada was doing in Haiti. Um, and at the end of the worst political repression in Haiti, um, I guess participating in this Haiti Solidarity Movement, I was, I was sort of confronted with my own uh, naivety about Canada's role in the world. Uh, before that, before the, uh, the coup in Haiti in 2004, I had an understanding that there was a class dynamic in Canada, there was an elite uh, and, a, and a majority of the population, and that the uh, social policy was mostly being oriented in the interests of the elite. I had a certain understanding of the dispossession of First Nations people um, that has created Canada, uh, but I didn't think that on the international stage that Ottawa acted just like, or acts just like, the bully in Washington. I had a certain understanding of U.S. foreign policy, and my, I assumed that Canada was different, that Ottawa was different uh, than the U.S. But participating in the Haiti Solidarity Movement, I was really sort of challenged. My, assumption, my assumptions were really challenged about Canada's role in the world. So at, at the end of the worst political repression in Haiti, which subsided um, in 2006, in early 2006, I decided to look into whether Canada has acted or is acting in a, uh, similarly to the way it had been acting in Haiti elsewhere. Um, uh, the second part of the motivation for writing this book was really this mythology that I was, that I was mentioning or alluding to, is that we found that when, when participating in the Haiti Solidarity Movement, we would tell people the Canadian International Development Agency is funding a highly partisan Haitian human rights organization, which has concocted a whole set of lies to justify imprisoning Haiti's constitutional prime minister, Haiti's constitutional interior minister, for a couple of years, um, by the way, um, that, that our aid agency, our aid dollars, which is supposed to go to helping the world's poor, were being used to fund this campaign against the, uh, the, the uh, ousted government, uh, and justifying imprisoning the constitutional prime minister. We would tell Canadians this was taking place, which it was, and most Canadians would just be like, that doesn't happen. That's not what Canada is about. So you really have to confront this mythology. And the mythology is, is that Canadians, according to a number of studies, have the highest self-appraisal of our country's role in the world. As many as 9 in 10 Canadians think Canada is a benevolent force in the world. Think of things like uh, peacekeeping, uh, Lester Pearson and his Nobel Peace Prize. Um, so, so part of the aims of this book, one of the aims of this book is to take on that mythology of Canada as just a benevolent force, which I saw as a real obstacle to building a um, Haiti solidarity. So what I have here is a uh, top ten list of um, things about Canadian foreign policy that you probably don't know uh, that you should know. In 1917, the Royal Bank loaned $200,000 uh, to a Costa Rican dictator by the name of Federico Tinoco. Just as Tinoco was about to leave office, uh, there was a popular uprising in the country. He was about to flee. Uh, Canada, Canadian Bank made this loan. Uh, Tinoco, as uh, uh, dictators are, are known to do, uh, took the money with him uh, when he left. The Royal Bank, of course, wanted their money back. They wanted um, the, the new Costa Rican government to repay the debt. Uh, uh, Tinoco, or sorry, the new Costa Rican government said, no, this is an odious debt. Royal Bank knew that Tinoco was about to leave. It's not up to the Costa Rican, pay, uh, Costa Rican people to pay back what the dictator stole uh, when the Royal Bank knew he was probably taking 